Good morning, everyone. Um, what I would like to do the next uh, 20, 25 minutes is to just go through some of the recent advances in myeloma. A lot has changed in both in terms of understanding the precursor phases in myeloma as well as treatments um, and the goal of treatment in this disease as well. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, obviously myeloma is always preceded by muggers or small ring myeloma, so can we actually prevent uh, either development of the precursor phases or actually the progression from precursor phase to active disease? So as you all know, the monoclonal gammopathies represent a spectrum of disorders that uh, encompasses monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, uh, which is the most common um, diagnosis when you have a monoclonal protein in the clinic. Uh, to um, active myeloma at the other end of the spectrum with a proportion of patients going through a small ring multiple myeloma phase in between. And uh, the, a lot of epidemiological studies have been done trying to identify the risk of progression. As, as you can see here, MGUS progresses at a rate of about 1% per year, which is constant throughout uh, from the starting from the diagnosis. In comparison, patients with small ring multiple myeloma actually progress at a rate of about 10% per year in the initial five years. And eventually, after the first 10 years, these patients have a rate of progression that's comparable to what you see in patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And this progression is usually associated with a gradual increase in the uh, tumor burden, both indicated by the proportion of plasma cells in the bone marrow as well as the M spike. Now, what we know is that all patients with myeloma have a precursor Muggers phase. And these are studies that have been done looking at samples that have been stored and showing that um, you can actually demonstrate a monoclonal protein up to eight years and beyond before the onset of uh, myeloma. Another critical thing is that most of the primary cytogenetic abnormalities that we associate with myeloma, such as trisomies and translocations involving the IGH, uh, region can be identified in monoclonal gammopathies uh, of undetermined significance and small ring multiple myeloma in a proportion that is relatively similar to what you see in um, multiple myeloma. Now, one thing we also know, um, again, based on some of the epidemiological studies that have been done, is that it probably takes anywhere from 10 to 15 years from the muggers to actually evolve into multiple myeloma. And, um, the, the vast majority of the patients with monoclonal gammopathy in the community are probably not diagnosed, uh, as you can see from the screening studies that have been done compared to what has been clinically detected uh, in patients who are seen in the clinic. Now, over the years, uh, there have been risk stratification systems that have been developed to identify who are the patients with MGUS who are likely to progress to active myeloma. On the left-hand side, you can see, um, again, the factors that have been identified include the serum M spike, uh, the type of M, uh, M protein, the IgG versus IgA or IgM, and the serum-free light chain ratios. Uh, more recently, we have looked at the impact of uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, and what we have been able to see is that patients who have low risk cytogenetic abnormalities have a very low, or in the absence of any uh, cytogenetic abnormalities um, detected by fish, uh, these patients have a much lower risk of progression compared to the patients uh, who have uh, uh, abnormalities found on the fish. Now, in, when you kind of switching gears, when you look at the patients with small ring multiple myeloma, uh, this is a slightly different. As I previously mentioned, the risk of progression is substantially higher in patients with small ring myeloma compared to those with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Now, this is important because, you know, the, as, as I previously showed, the vast majority of patients with MGUS don't progress to myeloma, making it much more harder to intervene with any kind of uh, therapeutic um, uh, interventions in those patients. In contrast, small ring myeloma actually presents us with the opportunity for therapeutic intervention because almost two-thirds of these patients will progress to active myeloma in 10 years from the time of diagnosis. So more recently, uh, as part of a larger international myeloma working group um, project, we looked at uh, redefining the progression criteria for small ring multiple myeloma and came up with a um, risk stratification system that uses the cutoffs that are shown here and demonstrated that if you have um, a high risk, which is two of these three abnormalities, then your risk of progressing to active myeloma is almost 80% um, in the population. Um, or is almost 50% in the first two years after our diagnosis, suggesting that this might be a group that is ripe for early intervention. 
And when we uh, incorporate some of the cytogenetic abnormalities, uh, we can actually develop a risk stratification system, which is rather a little bit more sensitive and specific. Um, and this actually, instead of just dichotomizing the values, we have used the entire spectrum of values to actually come up with a risk scoring system. And here we are able to identify a group of patients with a 80% risk of progression uh, at two years, suggesting that maybe some of these patients may actually have active myeloma and not necessarily uh, small ring myeloma. So that... So then the question is, you know, do we really have any evidence to say that early intervention really helps some of these patients? Now, this is data from the Spanish trial where they randomized patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma, defined differently than what I just showed, but nevertheless demonstrating that you can actually improve the progression-free survival or the time to progression to active myeloma. But I think most relevant is the fact that they actually improve the overall survival uh, in this cohort of patients by early intervention with lenalidomide and uh, dexamethasone compared to just observation. Now, one of the problems with this particular trial was that they did not use advanced radiological imaging such as PET scan or CT. So it's quite possible that a, almost a third of these patients might have had, uh, might have had act active myeloma rather than really high-risk smoldering myeloma. So more recently, the ECOG group actually did a phase three trial that again randomized patients uh, with high-risk smoldering myeloma to either getting lenalidomide alone versus observation and was able to show that there was a significant uh, decrease in the risk of progression to active myeloma with the early intervention using lenalidomide. More uh, importantly, when you actually look at the new uh, May of 2018 uh, progression criteria, you can see that the vast majority or nearly all the patients who actually derived a benefit from early intervention all belong to the high-risk group, thus not only validating the risk stratification system, but also reiterating the point that patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma has potentially, um, there's potential benefit for early intervention. Now, kind of switching gears here, when you know, when talk about the ac um, patients with active multiple myeloma, there have been considerable progress in terms of therapeutics, as we talked about yesterday. And I won't spend too much time on it, but just to highlight a few things. Um, one uh, important aspect in terms of myeloma has been the redefinition of what constitutes active myeloma that needs therapy. The traditional teaching has been that you have to have a CRAP features, which is the hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, bone lesions for patients to have active myeloma that needs therapy. And this, this was revised a few years ago to include a, a few other factors, what we call the, um, by the myeloma defining uh, features, which includes a clonal uh, bone marrow plasma cell percentage that's 60% or more, a free light chain ratio that's more than 100, and more than one focal lesions on MRI studies. And again, these are not lytic disease, these are non-lytic lesions that can be seen in the marrow. And one of, any one of these three actually predicts the risk of progression to active disease of 80% or more, suggesting that there is not much point in waiting to treat these patients, um, but rather than rather go ahead with treatment. And this actually uh, was a paradigm shift for myeloma, uh, from a traditional teaching of you know, treat only when there is actually endorgan damage, to start treating when there is a high probability of developing endorgan damage. And we also, um, over the years, have realized that uh, myeloma is not just one disease, but rather a collection of disorders that are all defined by different cytogenetic abnormalities. What we know over time is that all these patients have some underlying primary abnormalities. Nearly half of them have trisomies. The other half has what we call the IgH translocations involving five different partner chromosomes, as shown here. And the, the, for the trisomies, it's predominantly the MYC dysregulation that drives the process, whereas in the translocations, it's the cyclin dysregulation that drives the, uh, the myeloma process. Now, as this disease evolves, we see additional uh, changes such as deletions involving chromosome 17 and 1, amplification of chromosome 1Q, and a variety of uh, recurrent mutations, uh, about a dozen of them that you can identify in majority of patients with uh, myeloma. And what we know is that using these cytogenetic abnormalities, we can risk stratify these patients. And when you have these high-risk abnormalities as shown here, your median overall survival is only about uh, three years compared to the patients who don't have these abnormalities who have much better outcomes. 
Now, in the past, we have used the international staging system using the beta-2 microglobulin and serum albumin. And what was done a few years ago was to incorporate the cytogenetic abnormalities that we just talked about, and, and this led to the development of the revised ISS staging system, which gives us a better tool to distinguish how these patients would do with the more current therapies. So if you have an RISS stage 3 that is defined as an ISS stage 3 and either one of these high-risk features, either the high-risk cytogenetics or a serum LDS that's abnormal, your median overall survival, despite the newer therapies, tend to be rather uh, inferior compared to the other patients. Now, um, you know, we continue to try and uh, make the systems better. Um, and more recently, um, there have been studies looking at gene expression profiling and also looking at sequencing and identification of mutations that will also allow us to further stratify these patients in terms of their outcomes. So this is clearly a work in progress, and hopefully over the next few years, we'll have uh, systems that incorporate some of these sequencing data, the fish abnormalities, as well as the common um, laboratory parameters to better identify the patients who are not going to do well so that we can treat them better. So um, again, you know, the myeloma treatment paradigm in terms of the overall classification of the patients hadn't changed much. We still group them as transplant eligible and ineligible patients. Um, even though um, you know, the, the drugs that we use in these combinations have changed over time. Now, for the patients who are transplant eligible, the current approach is to use a combination of botosomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone based on the SWOG trial demonstrating an improved overall survival for the use of the triplet compared to the doublet. Uh, there is data from an uh, endurance trial that looked at carfilzomib, lenalidomide versus botosomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone that hopefully will be presented soon. Um, but the field is moving forward with the use of four drug regimens compared to the three drug regimens. This is data from the Cassiopeia trial that looked at addition of um, deletimumab to botosomib, thalidomide, dexamethasone, both for injection and consolidation. And this trial already have shown us that by using four drugs, we can get deeper responses uh, compared to the two drugs, which then translates into a better progression-free survival for these patients. Um, there's also uh, a trend towards improved overall survival for this study, but obviously we want to wait and see more mature data. Not only from, from this trial, but also from the phase three trials that are looking at the combination of deratimumab with uh, botosomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. The question that always comes up uh, is, we ask we have newer therapies, do we really still need an autologous stem cell transplantation for this disease? This is the French trial, the IFM 2009, which randomized patients with newly diagnosed myeloma to either getting botosomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone alone, um, eight cycles followed by LEN maintenance, versus five cycles of the triplet along with a stem cell transplant, and then going to LEN maintenance. And the IFM 2009 trial clearly showed us that the uh, use of stem cell transplant does lead to deeper responses, as uh, shown by the CR rate as well as the MRD negativity rate, which then also translated to a better progression-free survival, even though we don't see a difference in the overall survival yet with the current follow-up. Now, this point was again reiterated by the Forte trial, which actually looked at using a carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone injection therapy, and then looking at stem cell transplant versus no transplant. And as you can see here, even though the overall depth of response seems to be comparable with KRD or KRD with transplant, the probability of patients actually staying in an MRD negative state one year from transplant was more likely uh, in the setting of a stem cell transplant suggesting that the transplant still has something to add to this disease for the treatment of this disease, uh, even when we are using highly effective combinations like carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. Uh, what should be done after uh, autologous stem cell transplant? Uh, should we um, just do maintenance, or should we do consolidation, or should we be doing a tandem autologous stem cell transplant? Now, this is a meta-analysis of three different phase three trials, uh, clearly demonstrating that lenalidomide maintenance is associated with an approximately two-year improvement in overall survival uh, in patients following a single autologous stem cell transplant. And this appears to benefit all the patients except those patients with high-risk disease, such as ISS stage three, as well as patients with high-risk translocations. So for those patients, we have been using a botosomy-based maintenance, again, based on some data from the HOVON phase three trial that looked at botosomy as part of injection therapy and maintenance and demonstrating that there's an improved progression-free and overall survival for, you, for a proteasome inhibitor 
incorporated into the entire um, treatment um, continuum. Um, the question of tandem autologous stem cell transplant uh, has been addressed in this European trial, um, which randomized patients after a VCD injection to either stem cell transplant versus no stem cell transplant, and then also within the stem cell transplant, single versus double, and also trying to ask the question of consolidation versus no consolidation. Here you can see that in this particular trial, as well as a meta-analysis that was published from the European group, that patients do seem to do better with a tandem autologous stem cell transplant, in particular those patients who have high-risk abnormalities. In contrast, a similar trial that was done in the US called the STAMINA trial, again has a very similar randomization asking similar question. Just maintenance, or do we do consolidation followed by maintenance, or we do a tandem auto transplant followed by maintenance? This trial actually showed no difference between the three different approaches. However, uh, this likely reflects the differences in the injection therapy that was used, as well as the duration of injection therapy, which in this case was VRD combination, often used for uh, 6 to 12 months, compared to the European trial, which just used VCD injection therapy for a defined four cycles. So I think there's still some debate as to whether we should be using tandem autologous stem cell transplant, but I think the, most of the data would suggest that in high-risk patients, uh, it is something that it's reasonable to consider, especially if you are not using a VRD triplet injection therapy. So um, this again, just want to summarize the approach to the transplant eligible patients. Again, our approach has been to use for the patients with standard risk, VRD injection therapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant and maintenance. And in patients who want to defer transplant, we do allow them to do that uh, by collecting the stem cells and proceeding with continued injection therapy. Whereas in high-risk patients, we have been using Dratumumab VRD or KRD combinations followed by stem cell transplant and a proteasome inhibitor-based maintenance therapy. In the transplant ineligible patient group, again, there have been some um, you know, changes in terms of what we use. Um, the combination of botasimib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone has been adapted for use in the older patient population by using a more stretched out cycle for 35 day cycle instead of the 21 day cycle, and also using lower doses of uh, lenalidomide at 15 milligrams instead of 25 uh, milligrams. And the, re the results seem to be quite comparable to what we have seen with the phase three trial VRD combination in the um, younger patient population. Uh, we also used, um, again, the first trial showed us that we can actually uh, do away with melphalan in this patient population, and the uh, combination of lenalidomide dexamethasone used continuously till progression was associated with a better overall survival than using a melphalan prednisone thalidomide combination. And more recently, the Alcyon trial uh, looked at the, the role of deratimumab, a new monoclonal antibody in this patient population, showing that adding deratimumab to VMP significantly improved the progression-free survival, and there's more recent data showing that there's an improvement in overall survival as well. Finally, the Maya trial again showed that there's improvement in the progression-free survival when you used deratimumab in combination with lenalidomide dexamethasone, again highlighting that we don't really need a melphalan-based combination in this, um, or melphalan-based therapy in the older patients, and we can uh, safely uh, avoid that particular drug in the upfront setting. Um, now, the, one of the hotly debated topics in myeloma has been what should be the goal of therapy? How deep a response should you be targeting? And now we have, you know, the conceptually, um, the lower the disease burden that is left behind after therapy, the longer the time it takes for the disease to come back, and we're hoping that at some point we can get the disease to a low enough level that these patients can be cured of the disease. Based on the, um, the data from some of the meta-analysis, uh, the IMWG actually revised the response criteria a few years ago to incorporate the minimal residual negativity as one of the, criteria, as one of the levels of response, defining that as less than 1 in 10 to the power of 5 uh, nucleated cells uh, detected either by flow cytometry or by um, next-generation sequencing. And in addition, we also incorporated an imaging and MRD negative category that incorporates the use of PET scan in addition to the Barrow examination. And this has been demonstrated to be prognostic by in this meta-analysis. If you can see that patients, uh, with the, both the PFS and the overall survival is much better uh, when patients get to a MRD negative um, uh, with a variety of different therapies. 
So, um, and there's also data showing that the patients who actually benefit the most from getting to an MRD negative state are those patients who are high risk. So I think this opens up the uh, possibility of doing more, again, risk-adapted therapy, particularly uh, for patients with high-risk disease, where we kind of target the goal of an MRD negativity for high-risk patients. Again, this is um, based on retrospective data. There are prospective trials that are looking at the question of, you know, can we take a patient who is MRD positive and give them a different therapy in an attempt to make them MRD negative and thus improve their outcome, and also take the patients who are MRD negative uh, and you know, randomize them to stopping therapy versus continuing therapy to answer the question, can we use minimal residual disease negativity as a marker for, uh, um, again, limiting the duration of treatment in these patients? Now, finally, going into the supportive care, again, some one of the recent advances has been the use of denosumab. This is the phase three trial that looked at uh, denosumab versus allodronic acid, showing that they have comparable efficacy uh, in terms of uh, de uh, decreasing the risk of uh, skeletal-related events. This particular trial also had shown some improvement in the progression-free survival with the use of denosumab compared to salodronic acid, um, um, but we do need to see longer-term follow-up for that particular aspect. But it certainly opens up the opportunity for us to use either bisphosphonates or um, denosumab in patients with uh, newly diagnosed uh, disease. Another interesting set of data from a UK trial was this, where they used three cycles of liver flock or three or levofloxacin prophylaxis during the first three cycles after diagnosis um, during the injection therapy and showed that patients um, who received the levofloxacin had a better outcome in terms of reduced uh, time to febrile episodes or death. And when you look at the, um, the data in detail, you can see that it not only did uh, the levofloxacin decrease the risk of infections, and this seemed to be independent of what the impact that they saw with the um, uh, with the Bactrim prophylaxis that is routinely used in these patients. So I think in our own practice, we have routinely started using some antibiotic prophylaxis during the initial few months of injection therapy in newly diagnosed disease. And finally, I um, uh, want to just talk briefly on some of the newer advances in relapsed myeloma, some of which I referred to yesterday, so I won't go into more detail. Um, but again, um, you know, there's a variety of different phase three trials that have been done during the past few years, um, looking at a um, variety of different combinations with novel classes of drugs. So we have newer proteasome inhibitors like carfilzomib that can be combined with uh, just dexamethasone or with lenalidomide dexamethasone or pomalidomide dexamethasone. We have penobinostat that is a histone deacetylase inhibitor that is quite effective in combination with uh, bortezomib and dexamethasone, um, as shown in phase three trials. Um, you know, Dratimumab has been a real game changer for this disease and has been associated with good outcomes in combination with a variety of different drugs, including proteasome inhibitors as well as immunomodulatory drugs. Elotizumab is another monoclonal antibody that again is effective um, both in combination with uh, the emits and the proteasome inhibitors. And all these combinations um, have uh, shown um, you know, meaningful improvement in progression-free survival compared to the doublets. And similarly, they have, these drugs have also been combined with lenalidomide um, in a variety of phase three trials, again showing a significant improvement in the depth of response and improved progression-free survival. And again, the CAR-T um, cells, we will be hearing about that from Dr. Shah in the next session. Um, and um, so I'll skip over that. There's a new drug which is targeted against the B-cell maturation antigen. This is a toxin-conjugated antibody that hopefully will get approved for use in myeloma later this year. And then uh, finally, Selinexor, which is a nuclear transport protein inhibitor, has already been approved for use in myeloma. And the phase three trial was recently declared to be positive. So the, I think the next, uh, uh, the future of myeloma therapy is whether can we personalize the treatment for these patients based on some of the genetic abnormalities. Here's a proof of concept uh, in a patient with a BRAF V600E mutation where vemurafenib was used and associated with a significant improvement uh, in the soft tissue plasma cytoma associated with, again, decrease in the M spike. So based on these, we have uh, activated a trial that is looking at uh, next generation sequencing to identify mutations. And based on the, the mutation, we are assigning these patients to uh, different uh, therapies that are targeted towards the specific mutations. Obviously, it's a proof of concept study. We have to see if this will actually pan out for the future. 
And finally, the other exciting molecule, I think, for especially for the transduction level 14 myeloma, has been venetoclax, which has been shown to be quite effective uh, in that group of patients as a single agent, as you can see here with a overall 40% response rate. And the responses appear to be particularly uh, deep in patients who have a high BCL2 expression along with a low BCL XL and MCL1 expression. So I think, you know, obviously a lot of things have changed in myeloma. Um, we continue to make good progress in this disease, both in terms of understanding the biology and developing new therapies. But I think most importantly, I think uh, understanding the ability to intervene early can significantly change the natural history of this disease, as hopefully we will start intervening in the high-risk smoldering myeloma. Uh, and obviously, you know, um, personalized medicine, as with other cancers, has holds great promise as does immune therapies, as you will hear shortly. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumar, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. We have time for one quick question. A uh, quick question, Dr. Kumar. The Singapore group has published the artificial intelligence-based methods for finding the drug based on COPI method, Q QOPI, for myeloma. And there are multiple combinations, and they found out that a very cheap combination is very effective in personalized therapy. So are you doing that, or are, are groups in the U.S. doing that for myeloma drug combinations? We have so many drugs. I don't know what I to know. use. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to figure out what else, you know, because there are not comparative trials between the triplets versus triplets or quadruplets versus quadruplets. So there are some you know, approaches like network meta-analysis that have been looked at, trying to see if one particular combination can be good. There have been some functional in vitro assays that have been developed, that is, taking the myeloma patient cells and putting them through high throughput functional assays to see if specific combinations may be useful. The, the challenge is kind of reproducing the bone marrow microenvironment outside. It's not that easy. Um, I'm not very familiar with the particular one that you described, but um, certainly, you know, people are all trying to figure out how best can we identify the right treatment for the right patient. 